Hi everyone, thanks for coming to this session. Um, I just thought it was pertinent listening to the previous speakers about uh, what we're all here for. And since food is the thing we absolutely have to get right, the most important crafts in the world are that of farming and cooking. Um, and I guess that's the basis of coming from the ground up. Um, basically, um, my, my topic is, is the dilemma that farmers actually face on ground. To actually sequester soil carbon and try and help with some of the, the global problems of um, CO2 rise in the atmosphere, our role as farmers is to, to try and get rid of some of that CO2 out of the air. And to do that, we can actually do that through sequestration. To sequester, though, costs money. Um, just a little bit of background. Yeah, I'm married to, to Glenn. We have two small children. We live seven hours from the coast. Um, we manage 7,600 hectares of country. In a normal year, we have between 1,800 and, and 2,000 head of uh, breeder cattle. It is breeding country. We don't fatten on that country. And we're in a 20-inch rainfall zone. We sell our cattle to feedlots, grass-fed growers and abattoirs, and we do that in an intensive rotational system. Our goal um, as a family is to produce beef in a sustainable, profitable system and leave the country in a better shape than we found it. So we are nearly in the geographic centre of Queensland, and by the map of Queensland, we're, we're actually in the outback, just. Um, I borrowed this from the the bomb information and that green patch in the middle of Queensland is um, showing that the actual rainfall that's hit the ground is actually increasing in, in our area. So whether that's due to uh, climate change, I'm quite happy if it is because it means we're getting wetter. Um, our intensive grazing system and our infrastructure development has um, changed the landscape somewhat on our place. The 1995 picture is an excellent potential for a carbon sink. Um, in the subsequent years after we started resting and rotating and, and spreading our stock waters and things, we were able to swim a little bit and then we we're truly sequestering in in 2010, I took, um, we, we bought our, our Granville in 1995 in a pretty, um, if it was real estate, it would be a renovator's dream. So um, it was a renovator's dream and, and hopefully by these few pictures you can see what we've done to, to change things there. Okay, so this is um, our increase in carrying capacity. Our, the local area carrying capacity is about one to 35 acres, so quite sparse, quite arid, semi-arid rangeland type country. This is in LSU, so livestock units, not in head carrying capacity. 2011, we peaked at 5,000 LSUs. Um, we've had seasonal changes since then, and, and we've actually destocked according to our rainfall and our grass cover, etc. We just had, I've just been to England and got back about 10 days ago and haven't been home because we had an excellent rainfall event where we had about a 100 kilometre radius had a dumping of between 4 and 11 inches of rain and it's uh, stopped me from getting home. We've um, been cut off, all our roads have been flooded and that was a, just a freak event that's happened which coincides with what the previous speakers have said is happening. Oh, sorry, by the way, that gap was um, the driest years on record, and we actually totally destocked then, which takes a fair bit of uh, ticker to do when you actually have to get rid of all your cattle. Um, my concern as a mother and as a, as a GDP producer in Queensland is that um, we produce nearly 20% of Australia's GDP. Of the top 11 of those, um, <coughs> Four are in agriculture, the rest are in finite resource, mining resource things. And uh, I think in our lifetime, 
the white ones will be exhausted. So uh, in terms of Australia's GDP, I am concerned that um, agriculture will have to step up pretty much to keep us in the lifestyle that we're accustomed to in Australia. There's no other, there's only resources and agriculture that seem to be propping up most of Australia at the minute. In saying that, I think there's a disproportionately low level of ag representation in government and policy arena when you consider that those are the drivers of, of our lifestyle. Um, soil carbon sequestration. Um, during my Nuffield research trip, the biggest question and the most frequently asked question I got was what is actually sequestration? And it's the process of sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and back into the soil via plants and the root system of plants. Um, soil contains 80% of all carbon on the earth, excepting the ocean, which is mostly contains inorganic carbon. It would then suggest that soil and its overall health are an integral part of a healthy planet. Game changes for soil carbon are not new. The ability to mass store food and stop, deteri stop it deteriorating in conjunction with the industrial revolution and world exploration and the need to store food on ships taking long journeys across the sea saw the start of mining carbon out of soils. The 1790s uh, the signalled the process of canning and the 1840s the invention of glass storage jars which um, started unbalancing the carbon flows. And it's continued unabated since then. Um, some figures for this time of the afternoon. That's just some um, total terrestrial carbon in, in, the, in the ecosystems of the Earth. Soil contains 80% of that. The thing that interests me is two-thirds of the increase in atmospheric CO2 is from burning fossil fuels, which as farmers we can't really do that much about. Um, One-third is from soil organic carbon loss due to land use change, which is exactly what Carl was talking about in his speech. Um, given that soil carbon reserves are around 2,500 gigatons, we need to replace um, what's been lost from that which is about between 50 and 100 gigatons to the soil. Some of the work that I did in my research showed that um, by doing that it does have a, an effect on global warming as such. And must remember that it wasn't done with ill intent that the soils have been mined of this carbon. Um, it just demonstrates the ingenuity of humans to improve their chances of survival. The upside of the depletion of soil carbon has created a soil carbon deficit that represents an opportunity to us as farmers to restore carbon through land management practice change. Um, the exciting opportunity for me and for farmers across the world is the power of intent to reverse and significantly improve um, the soils and in turn their productivity, resilience to climate events and ultimately make profit for themselves. <laughs> So one thing we have to do, and which isn't done very well in agriculture, is, is, is define the difference between agroecology and environmentalism. I think they get meshed in together a fair bit, that, that uh, even, in, even in my realm as a grazier, that unless you're doing industrial agriculture, uh, you're a hippie and you're um, a tree hugger, etc. So when we're implementing all our changes at home, it is, it is out of the culture of our district and we were considered odd and strange and, and um, not the norm. So yeah, we need to separate agroecology and environmental, environmentalism and it's important to make the distinction between ecosystems in farming and e environmental activism. Um, the legitimate difference is that agroecology R&D and soil science find definitive solutions to specific global problems as opposed to environmentalism, in particular enviro-political activism, which seeks to inhibit progress and avoid real issues such as feeding the world's population. In some agricultural realms it is perceived that alternative management systems decoupled from industrial agricultural models are somehow green, which is what I just said. Um, some of the terms that I found on my research was uh, bananas was the best one. So that's you ban anything near anyone, near anywhere. And that's prolific, not only in Australia, but across the, across the world. Um, the problem that 
I guess the environmentalists have is that practices that lift soil carbon also improve profitability, drought tolerance and biodiversity. Sequestering soil carbon precipitates a positive shift in, in ag, ag practices. So as farmers, we need to actually start focusing on sequestration and um, then we'll have a shift. I also found that you actually need animals and you need animal impact in ecosystems. The, the map on the, on the left is that of the Northwick Research Farm, which is part, part of Rothamsted Research Facilities in England. Um, when I asked them what the red zone was, which is their highest level soil carbon on their, on their research farms, it turns out that they're actually been dairied for 200 years. So they've had livestock continuously in those, in those paddocks. Um, and hence the high levels. The, the green is um, arable cropping and has been mined of, of its carbon levels. They're doing a 30 year research project on looking at soil carbon sequestration in those, those areas and um, I'm really interested to know how that goes. Um, 30 year research project is probably unheard of in Australia and um, to actually make a difference with soil carbon you have to take a longer longer time than say a three year political cycle to, to see the effects of change. The one on the right is um, the grazing effect on grass root mass and to sequester soil you need good root mass. Um, the one on the left has been overgrazed so it, it, it actually has lost its root mass density. The middle one has been grazed right which is how we graze at home so rest, rotation, wet seasonal salt spelling. The one on the right is um, like our national parks that are left locked up, no stock um, and they have no root mass. The graziers that want to farm, um, want to graze the snowy mountain would know intuitively that it's the wrong thing to do and, and it's because that root mass is gone and they actually intuitively understand that you need to graze grasses to, to have them in their best, you know, best condition. So um, one thing that I found um, was root depth and basically the, the circled letters are the root depth of, of most mainstream plants. In Australia we tend to measure 30 centimetres, all of those um, species are all way, way, way deeper than 30 centimetres. Um, I think Australian research needs to look at having our base soil carbon tests done to a metre, not 30 centimetres, to give a more accurate um, profile of Australian soils. The co-benefits of soil carbon sequestration are many and varied um, for all those reasons up there. The main one, you can't under, ast, underestimate the feel-good factor of actually looking at going into your, into your pastures, taking photos of, of your country and then reviewing that over the years and seeing what happened in those earlier slides that I had there. You don't actually see it happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's quite um, nice to look back and see that, that, that you've actually got ground cover like we have at home. <clears throat> so one problem with um, arid and semi-arid environments is actually keeping the carbon in the soil. We can sequester carbon, no worries at all, but it's keeping it there and changing grazing management long term. That is the issue for graziers in northern Australia. Um, to do that, there has to be a huge educational um, lift in northern Australia to understand the soil food web and how that, how that actually impacts on, on ground cover and keeping carbon there. The, the hardest phase for us was the financial phase of loss of production when you change from standard continuous set, set stocking. Our, our infrastructure development cost in, in excess of $2.1 million to do, of which we both worked off farm to fund that. Um, it's a lot of kilos of beef a year to um, to actually implement those changes that we've done. We're happy we did it. We were young and had full of energy and, and, um, and was worth doing. But the financial constraints of actually sequestering or keeping the status quo and swimming or treading water is, um, 
is a hard one for graziers in particular at the moment with this drought to actually take the step and change their grazing management. You also have to have the want to wean off industrial agriculture to do it. So where to from here? Um, we have a general thing of worry about what you can change, don't worry about what you can't. We, I can't do too much about what Carl was talking about, about the fossil fuel issues with, in atmosphere, but we can do something about the land use issues and, and actually fixing the soil, which in turn fixes food, which in turn causes resilience, etc. Um, for us and for the Australian beef industry, we need to be looking at branding and product differentiation in an international realm and looking at sustainable branding, et cetera, and regenerative of ac activities in terms of branding meat. Um, if we want to make money out of carbon, I'm not sure that we'll do it in a carbon trading realm, but I'm sure we can do it in private treaty or private contract things with mining companies that need to offset carbon, their carbon. We also need to look at different funding models for agriculture. As I said, um, it's taken us from 1995 to now to see changes. Um, a lot of your banking institutions wouldn't say, if we went to them today, I mean, to do what we've done would have, now would cost us about four, four and a half million, because poly's like tripled in value since we laid all 120 kilometres of poly pipe. <laughs> Um, to go to a bank and say, look, we want to change our systems, keep, give us $4 million to do it, they're just going to laugh at you. So at some point there's got to be some governmental, banking, institutional change in, in how they look at, look at funding agriculture. I guess that, that's happened in Europe and in, in North America with subsidies. Um, not that I want to go to a subsidy system, but we need some sort of change or fundamental shift in how, how graziers borrow money and the term of loans. Um, we also need to be pushing for nutrient density premiums in food. Once you fix the soil, your nutrient density comes up again, um, which no one in the world that I saw in my travels is actually doing. You look at BRICS levels and things in, in, in vegetables, but no one actually looks at micronutrients like zinc, selenium, those types of things. If we, if we want to use GM, rather than putting it into, you know, folate in wheat, we need to use GM proactively to look at palatability, root mass, multiplying tillers, super sequestering grasses and, and, so, and super soil biota, as opposed to just band-aiding problems. And that's what I was talking about. There's a, there's, a, there's a whole movement in America called slow money funding where private equity people, large, large investors, um, are happy to park their money for up to 50 years. And um, so that's just two generations, really. Um, and, and be prepared to do things like have no return for five years until you get the, the soil st starting to change. Um, also, the, the issue of international finance, um, I see that that can be a, a good thing where you've got countries like China that are short of land, happy to invest long term in Australian land and also build into some of that uh, carbon and biological focus that could be done at a policy level. And so I just want to reiterate because I think it's in incredibly important that we need to get food right and we need to get cooking of it right as well. Thank you.